Good morning, everybody. My name is Alara Stefanik Gadet, and my pronouns are they, them. And I have the great privilege this morning of being a co collaborator with Reverend Rosemary Morrison, our newly installed minister. We're going to begin this morning with a land acknowledgement. I always speak about how CUC elder Sharon Jinkerson Brass, who I'm sure many of you have seen or heard of in passing, if not through me and other means, has taught me that a part of my reconciliation journey is speaking more from the heart and less from a script, because when we speak from the heart, there's space for spirit to move into a space that doesn't exist when we're speaking from a script. It allows for that vulnerability. And that's not everybody's reconciliation journey, but that's where I'm at on my journey of reconciliation. So I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered here on Treaty 6 territory. We are in Amiskwichi, Waskahekin, which is colonially known as Edmonton and means Beaver Hills House in Cree. We are a gathering place traditionally of many people because people would come here to gather even if it's their, not their traditional home. So we are the gathering place of the Nehiya, which are the colonially known as the Cree, the Niaskapi, who are colonially known as the Blackfoot, the Nakoda Sioux, the Soto, the Inuit, the Anishinaabe, and many, many other First Nations peoples. We are also situated here in Métis 4 of the Métis, or excuse me, Region 4 of the Métis Nation. A land acknowledgement is a place to start. It's a beginning. It's a way to remember that we are all treaty people here on this land and what that means for you. I encourage you to explore what that means for you. For me, it means being in relationship with indigenous people and also as my brand new shirt says, reconciling within myself because there are places within ourselves that colonialism and capitalism injure and wound within our lives on a daily basis, and it's up to us to do the work to understand where those places of wounding are and to find ways to heal them, because that's how we heal the relationships in our lives. So with that acknowledgement, I will move us into our welcoming. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. I am one of your service leaders this morning, and we are collaboratively leading with Reverend Ro Rosemary Morrison. As Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together not by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, our understanding of the interconnectedness of all life guided by our eight principles and drawing from many, many sources. We hope you feel welcome here. Whatever you believe or do not believe, whoever you love, however you understand family, whatever your race, ethnicity, or ability, you are welcome here. We invite you to join us in a journey of free thought, spiritual questing, and justice making for as long as you feel comfortable doing so. We expend, extend a special welcome to our visitors this morning. Please join us after the service for conversation and coffee. Our community extends beyond Sunday mornings. We have a monthly newsletter available online and you can join our virtual community on Facebook and Twitter to keep up to date on happenings in our extended community. Each month at UCE, we focus on a soul matter theme. Our theme this month is pluralism. And this morning's service promises to encourage digging deep and having fun with that theme. I'm going to take a space here for any announcements. I know Rosemary has an announcement and I have an announcement. Do we know if we have any other announcements? I'm here. All right, so it's just Rosemary and I this morning. Go for it. Oh, um, my first announcement, I. First of all, good morning and welcome. My name is Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my honor and pleasure to serve this congregation. 
this Unitarian Church of Edmonton. What a fun time we had last weekend here. <laughs> there was a lot of folks coming and going in the building. There was, um, I came in many times, and there was sleeping bags and sleeping pads in the sanctuary and up on the chalice. It was a, an absolutely fabulous weekend for uh, Canoodle, for Chorus, for the installation we had. Um, 170 folks here, 165 or 170 folks here in the sanctuary. We were like right out to the walls and uh, a tremendous amount of people put their hearts and souls into making the installation happen, happen, canoodle happen. People had to stay up all night long. Um, over, yeah, yeah, Maria did. So um, my heartfelt thank you, this is my big announcement, my heartfelt thank you to everyone that was here everyone that contributed, everyone that worked. I, I have no idea who all did, so I'm just going to bring a cake next <laughs> week. And so everybody will get cake after the service next week, and that's my thank you, um, general thank you, but there are thank you cards uh, to those that I know that took leadership roles. Um, they'll be uh, headed your way very soon. Um, the second thing I would like to mention is that tomorrow evening at Brewster's is our monthly you use on tap. Um, I'll arrive around 5.30, happy hour start, stops at 6. So <laughs> the deals end then. Uh, it is a family-friendly place. There is a kid's menu. It is not just for adults, and it isn't just for, it's, it's for us to get together in a relaxed and friendly atmosphere and get to know each other in a little different way. And over to you, Alara. Yeah. So I would also like to announce that after the service today, we are having our first celebratory transgender potluck. Um, so are we, I'm just, I'm looking at Erica to make sure I have the details right, but we are gonna be gathering every last sun, fourth, there we go, great, thank you. I love finger counting. <laughs> the fourth Sunday of every month after the service, we are going to be having a transgender potluck to celebrate celebrate our little place in the rainbow. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to you to introduce our prelude. Our prelude this morning is um, Do Not Fear Love by Tanya Tagak. 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 Thank you. I know I should have asked you sooner. Yeah. I would like to invite Lynn Markham up to light our chalice this morning. And I have two poems for you from the writings of Chief Dan George, which will become clear to you why I have chosen the chalice lighting and extinguishing from Chief Dan George's writing. The beauty of the trees, the softness of the air, the fragrance of the grass speaks to me. The summit of the mountain, the thunder of the sky, the rhythm of the sea speaks to me. The faintness of the stars, the freshness of the morning, the dewdrops on the flower speaks to me. The strength of fire, the taste of salmon, the trail of sun, and the life that never goes away, they speak to me, and my heart soars. Keep a few embers from the fire that used to burn in your village. Someday, go back so all can gather again and rekindle a new flame for a new life in a changed world. Thank you, Lynn. We're going to sing together hymn number 1017, Building a New Way. The words will appear on the screen behind me, and I invite you to rise in body and or in spirit as you are able.
Every week in our church, we take up an offering. We are privileged to offer many gifts in community, our time, our talents, our presence with each other, and money of the, for those of us who can. It's good to remind ourselves from time to time that the offering is symbolic as well as practical. We plast the plate during a worship service to make a community expression of thanks for the blessing of abundance. And I'm just gonna have our, offer, our ushers just pause until I'm done. To visibly bring in the harvest at this most cherished hour of our week. Our offering says that the act of giving is as essential to our spiritual well-being as anything else we do here on Sunday mornings. I would invite you, as the plate comes around, to please just pause with it and feel the warmth of the wood and the warmth of community as the plate touches your hands, even if you put nothing into the plate. Every month, we choose an organization to share our abundance with. And this month, we are donating half of our proceeds to the Youth Empowerment and Support Services, YES. YES describes itself as having youth support centers that are, quote, 24-7 single point of access to immediate and low barrier physical, mental, cultural, and emotional health supports and safe places to stay for youth aged 15 to 21 who are experiencing crisis in the Edmonton metro area. Youth support centers also host Monday to Friday resource and health clubs with physical and mental health clinics and youth supporting resources to ensure youth 15 to 24 get the help they need when they need it and where they need it in their community. The organization emphasizes that their quote, focus is building strong collaborations with our youth agency collaboration partners to leverage what each of us does best to create more effective processes, outcomes, and opportunities for youth. Within that spirit of generosity, I invite us into a time of meditation. Could we get the lights down, please? Thank you. Beautiful. I want to welcome you into you a space of embodiment. We are creatures of body and spirit and mind come together into these miraculous packages of humanness. I invite you, if it's comfortable for you to do so, to let your eyes close. And just to feel your breath and where it goes in your body. It lives in different places in all of us. Some of us, our breaths land in our chest. Some of us we can feel our breath down in our belly. Some of us can feel it in our backs, mid-back, lower back. Where does your breath land? Just feel it for a few breaths. There are many ways of knowing in this world and our bodies have messages for us that often in our busy lives with our busy minds, we forget to hear and forget to feel. So I just invite you to really feel into your body right now. What comes up with that invitation? Where is your attention drawn when you're invited to feel into your body? Is there an ache or a pain, an area of tension? Or maybe you feel great today and your body is telling you, yes, you're alive. Just 
feel into that for a moment. Really just hear it. What is the message? I'm just going to invite us into a moment of silence to spend time with our body in this place together. And then I invite us to take a big, deep breath together, an inhalation and an exhalation. And then one more time, an inhalation and an exhalation. And then when you're ready, I invite you back into the room. Open your eyes. Welcome back. And as we continue on in the spirit of meditation and quietude, we'll sing together hymn number 1011, Return Again. I invite you to stay seated and stay in that spirit if you like. The invitation is to stay in that time of quietude and rest. Yeah, it's supposed to be around, so I guess the, uh, the spirits of the slideshow, slide projection, decided that we should be singing it in a round, even though that wasn't the plan, and so <laughs> it was wonderful to hear some harmonies. <laughs> it was great. We'll carry on. Staying in this quiet-ish space, we're going to enter into a time of candle lighting for all of the joys and concerns that we have. And this morning, we're going to invite some spoken candles. So we have two options. We have a microphone at this end. If you would like to come and light a candle and share a joy or a concern or a celebration or whatever's on your heart, as long as it's personal in our microphone. And then on the other side, if you would prefer to share a candle in silence, you're welcome to come along this side of the sanctuary. And if you are online, I would invite you to write your cares and celebrations and concerns in the chat with us. So we're going to enter into that time now. Let's have some candles.
As you come forward with spoken candles, please say your name and pronouns if you're willing. Good morning. Tasi. Buongiorno, Dias. My second language is Spanish. My first language is uh, English, obviously. The candle I wrote uh, uh, that I um, lit this morning, I lit four candles. One is for a child who is dying of cancer. This is a terrible thing for a young child. I, I have only met this child once, and I really don't know the family well, but they are among uh, people in a community that uh, I um, encounter people through. So this, the first candle was for him. The other three are for people in, in my own family circle. Um, one is an in-law and the other two are close to me here in this city. And they've all been ill for a very long time. They're adults, but they've been ill for most of their lives. So I told them I would light a candle for them. Well, I told one of them I would light a candle for her. And so it is done. Donna Hammer. I lit a candle for Elaine Reynard. Elaine had a fall and has broken, I'm not sure if it's her arm or her shoulder. She's in the Misericordia Hospital and sent her, sent her greetings if you can and hopefully she'll be home soon. But um, yeah, unfortunate. Lara, Stephanie, Cadet, still, they, them. Um, I'm lighting a candle of gratitude. This past week was the first time I got to go to Ministry Days, which is the big national UU Ministers of Canada gathering. We had the largest pot in Canada here in Edmonton, and it was a joy and a privilege to be a part of. And my second candle is for my mom, who also experienced a number of falls next week last week, excuse me, <laughs> in the future, no, last week, and didn't injure herself, thank God, but is in a very in-between space right now, I'll say that. Rosemary, she, her. Um, I, lo I lit two candles. One is for um, our custodian, new custodians, Todd and Christina. Todd um, suffered a major stroke on Friday morning and is in um, the U of A hospital in the neurology unit. Um, so I was with, I saw the family yesterday at, at the hospital and um, prognosis is still very unclear. Um, the second candle is for David Hagel. Um, he is in also in the neurology department, and the family has asked me to let you know that he has an inoperable brain tumor. And um, so I was with him and the family yesterday, and I will be going back to U of A to visit with both of those families today, and I'll, I'll send my love. I'll bring your love with me love and care and comfort for, for the families of Dave and Todd. My name is Audrey Brooks, she, her. My, uh, my candle is for three people today, for Oleg Maslov, who is uh, one of my Ukrainian guests, who is now in his fourth uh, week 
in the Grey Nun Hospital. His vital signs are very good, so they're going to keep up with the, c the chemo. They sent me a picture yesterday, and he looks not too bad. Um, my other two candles are, one is for Bonnie Sharplin, and the other one is for my great-grandson, Kaysen Brooks, who it's almost a year now since he died. He was 13 years old. Thank you. Hi, my name is she, her. Well, no. <laughs> Close. My name is not she, her. My name is Ferguson. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm really glad for my happy family, my home, and my animals. Thank you. Thank you all so much for sharing those pieces with us. It's the sharing that makes us a true community. So much gratitude. I'm going to pass the mic to Rosemary to begin. Indigenous ways of knowing. As a settler, a settler white woman whose family homesteaded in Saskatchewan on free land brought to my paternal grandparents were brought to this country at the promise of free, la free land and homesteaded in uh, northeast of Saskatoon. Uh, lots of my family are still there and some of them are still farming the land in that area. My maternal grandparents uh, arrived in Canada from the United States in about 1910 and homesteaded in the Maple Creek, Robsart area. My mother was born in Robsart. And, um, but my matern maternal side of my family has been on this continent since 1730, when Daniel Morrison arrived in the eastern part of the United States um, and made his home in the United States for since. So there's been Morris, fam my family of Morrisons have been here since 1730, but not in Canada till around 1910. And I tell you this because it's hard for <coughs> myself and uh, to present a service on indigenous ways of knowing without saying who I am and where I come from, because that's important to, for us to know where we have come from and the land that we came from. My family came from um, England and Scotland, the Outer Hebrides. Growing up, my family, uh, my dad bought a farm in Chilliwack, just south of Chilliwack in Sardis, and that piece of property was across the street from the Chiacton Indian Reserve and I grew up from the ages of 10 to 17, living across from the, from the reserve. And um, as I've often told people, it was way funner over there. And that's where I spent a lot of my, my days and my hours with my best friends, Patty and Gloria Jo. I learned from them that I was a person of worth, perhaps. I didn't get that in, in my own home. Uh, we, roamed, we roamed the brambles and the bushes while my family and the other white settlers got the, la the fertile, flat land that was not brambles and bushes and up the hill. I could see the disparity from my own family. They welcomed me into their little home that is still standing and should have been replaced decades ago. I drove by it not too long ago. They welcomed me into their little home, but my parents never welcomed them into our home, and I never really picked up on that until actually a few years ago. I want to talk a little bit. Um, the last thing I want to say, I want to uh, tell you about a very important moment in my life. I was uh, skipping out of school and hanging out with my friend Bones Kelly. And sh we became involved in the production of The Ecstasy of Rita Joe that was being put on in the Evergreen Theater, Evergreen Hall in Chilliwack. And um, I had a 
kind of a few jobs uh, to do. Nobody seemed to think I should go back to school, which I, when I look back on it, I think it was kind of odd. <laughs> but um, I was backstage a lot, and as the Winnipeg Ballet was putting on The Ecstasy of Rita Joe, and Chief Dan George was producing and directing that, pr that piece, and I was backstage quite a bit. And of course, because he was directing and producing, Chief Dan George was also backstage quite a bit. So um, I had no idea really who he was, except a kindly elderly man. And we would sit on, well, I knew he had written, uh, written the play. And we would sit backstage for hours on drums. And uh, he taught me how to play Bones, this game called Bones. Um, the important thing that happened from that interaction that I had with Chief Dan George um, was it was really the first time that someone looked at me. I may or may not be able to say all of this without crying. Um, the first time really that an adult had looked at me and, and actually seen me. It was an experience that I hadn't actually had before. He saw my potential perhaps. He saw who I really was. And um, he showered me with his amazing presence and kindness. And I will treasure those days sitting on drums, playing bones with Chief Dan George for the rest of my life. I consider myself to be very privileged to have done so. What we would like to present to you is a play that lives, we're going to do like a reading of a play, and this play lives in the middle of a book that you may be aware of. It's called Embers by Richard Wagamies. And in that book, there is a conversation between old woman and Richard Wagamies. I will read the parts of old woman. And, and I'm Richard. And Alara will read the parts of me. It says me. So uh, we just left it. So it's you, because it's me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we would like to share that with this with you. And then Alara will, will close, close it up. Yeah. We decided that the best way to present Indigenous ways of knowing was to lift up our stories of experience, but also the voices of Indigenous peoples. So we have. Music by Indigenous peoples, Tanya Tagak is a very well-known Inuit singer, Richard Wagamies, and we've got Chubby Cree for the closing. So we wanted to, we wanted to bring forward Indigenous teachings through their words and through our experiences. So here I am, I'm, I'm me. <laughs> What's the best way to learn to be spiritual? Backlight. What do you mean? Carry only what you need for the journey. Don't tire yourself out with unnecessary stuff. Like what? Like your head. Like your talk. Spirituality isn't found in your head. It's found in your heart. It isn't found in big, important-sounding words or long speeches. It's found in silence. If you travel with your heart and your heart quiet, you'll find the way to be spiritual. I found my first step on the journey that day. What's the purpose of ceremony? To lead you to yourself. How? By giving you an idea of who you want to be and then allowing you to create the experience of being that way. Which ceremony is the best then? life. Choose what leads you to the highest vision you can have of yourself, and then choose what allows you to express that. What you express, you experience. What you experience, you are. How do I prepare? Breathe. Why am I alive? Uh, because everything else is? No, I mean the purpose. That is the purpose, to learn about your relatives. My family? Yes. The moon, stars, rocks, trees, plants, water, insects, birds, mammals. Your whole family. 
learn about that relationship, how you're moving through time and space together. That's why you're alive. Always be gentle. You mean polite, gracious, humble? No, I mean always be a gentle person. Act softly and kindly to others and to yourself. In everything? Yes, in everything. You don't need to be hard. Like others may say, hard things break. Soft things never do. Be like grass. It gets stepped on and flattened, but remains its shape again once the pressure passes. It is humble, accepting, and soft. That's what makes it strong. Sometimes, when things are the hardest, it feels like Creator's not listening. Creator can do whatever Creator chooses. When we are in doubt or confusion or fear, she could send us thunderbolts or lightning or a huge pile of unexpected cash. But most of the time, she sends people. People are the miracles that emerge from the ripped and worn patterns of your life and help you stitch it back together. You learn to see the pattern better then. What does it mean to believe? It means to trust with your whole heart, to have faith. It means to have courage to act out of your belief. How do I do that? You have to be honest. What do you mean? You have to live your belief every day. To believe in something and not live it is dishonest. I became a better person that day. I can't seem to get anywhere in my life. Without creator. Say, without creator at the end. I can't seem to get anywhere in my life without creator? Did you hear that? Anytime you're telling yourself there's something you can do, can't solve, can't change, can't accept, say it out loud and add without creator. Add the same words to all the things you can do as well. I can get anywhere in my life with creator. I think you're getting it. My deal with Creator is this. I'm dragging a sack of old worries, hurt, anger, doubt, and fear up a long hill trying to get to the other side, to relief, to healing. Creator says, if you need a hand, I'm here. You pull and I'll push. I say, really? Creator says, I promise that I will always be there to help you but there's a catch. I say, what's the catch? Creator says, you have to pull first. <laughs> what is the point of prayer and meditation? To bring you closer to the great mystery. So I can understand it? No. So you can participate in it. I grew up spiritually after that. What's the hardest spiritual thing I'm ever going to have to do? To see every person as a gift. What kind of gift? The best kind, ba based on the way you receive them. I don't get it. I know, but you will. If you receive others as worthy, lovable, spiritual creations, perfect just the way they are, you get to see the highest possible version of who you are. You get to be that, experience that, and you become a gift to the world. Sounds hard. The longer you think about that, the harder it, it gets. Funny thing is, she was right. <laughs> Why does Creator test me sometimes? She doesn't. You test you. But I don't. 
things just happen. And that's when you test yourself. Rather than trusting, you slip back into believing that creator is not love but judgment. That's when you believe again that you can fail, that you need to prove your worthiness. When you reclaim fear as a driving energy. I don't feel like I do that. No one does. But Creator does not give you tests. What she gives you are opportunities to prove to yourself how much you want to change and grow. It's never Creator who does the convincing. This is what I carry into the future. I've been waiting for messages from Creator. They always come, but waiting is not seeing. Expecting is not feeling. Demanding is not hearing. I don't get it. I know. But those clouds are Creator's handwriting. That wolf track in the mud is Creator's touch. Those birds singing in the trees are Creator's voices. A drum beating on your own heartbeat is Creator's Morris code. Children and elders and life itself our creator's exclamation marks. I started to get the message after that. <laughs> why do I use a drum? To touch the earth. Then why do I sing with it? To allow the earth to touch you. What am I singing for? So that someday you might sing the one note that joins your heartbeat and the earth's heartbeat to the heartbeat of everything. You're saying that drumming and singing, anything that leads me inward and then outward are just like praying and meditating. You are getting wiser. What is the point of all this ceremony, this prayer, this damn hard work? To awaken from the dream. What dream is that? The illusion that what we see is all there is, that this physical world is the real one. Are there higher dreams then? Yes, dreams of unity over aloneness, blessings over fear, freedom over blame, unlimited spiritual possibility over limited material gain. You're telling me all this is possible? I'm telling you to choose to awaken. All is possible once you do that. You always repeat things three times. Just the important things. Why? I hear you the first time. No. You listen the first time, you hear the second time, and you feel the third time. I don't get it. When you listen, you become aware. That's for your head. When you hear, you awaken. That's for your heart. And when you feel, it becomes a part of you. That's for your spirit. Three times. It's so you learn to listen with your whole being. That's how you learn. What's the greatest teaching in life? You have to make your own moccasins. You're kidding, right? <laughs> no. You make them from the hide of your experience, all the places you have walked. You sew them with the thread of the teachings, the lessons embedded in all the hard miles. You stitch them carefully with the needle of your intention to walk a spiritual path. And then, when you are finished, you realize that Creator lives in the stitches. That's what helps you walk more gracefully. I got busy learning how to sew. <laughs> what do I need to live at my best? Truth and courage. Not purpose and strength? Truth and courage are purpose and strength. They are the roots of everything powerful, everything spiritual. When you keep your truth in front of you and have the courage to keep 
moving toward it through anything that arises, you live your best. Even if I stumble? Especially then. I began to walk more gracefully after that. You can't fix your head, what's in your head, using what's in your head. What do I do then? Unlearn. How do I do that? Choose differently. Tell me about love. It is our only real choice, the only thing that we can truly give. How do we do that? Choose it above all else. Love is you leading me back to the, love is you leading back to the highest possible version. It's me leading you back to where you were created to be. It is the most important choice we can make for each other. Those closest to us, you mean? No. Everyone. Everything. Widening our circle at every opportunity. Sounds hard. And so is being born, and we all do that. How do I find creator? You become what you seek. Oh, I don't understand. You decide what creator is. If you decide she is peace, love, humility, and non-judgment, you decide to work toward embodying those qualities in your walkabout world. The closer you get to that, the closer you are to finding creator. That's what our ceremonies are for, to teach you what creator is in you, that she always was and always will be. What's the secret to life? That's an easy one. Learning to love it. Even the hard parts? Even the pain? Especially those. When you reach out to the love of living instead of the fear of dying, you create more life. That sounds like hard work. Choose moments, then, and let the days take care of themselves. What does it mean to recover? It is to be reborn. We arrive here covered in spiritual qualities like innocence, humility, trust, acceptance, and love. But things happen, and those qualities get removed from us. Those qualities get churched off, spanked off, schooled off, and beaten off. Sometimes we rinse them off ourselves with drugs and booze and poor choices. But when we start to walk with Creator again, we're graced with the opportunity to recover ourselves in those qualities. Does it hurt? Sometimes, but that's what makes the journey so magical. The hurt? No, the days you wake up without the hurt. But how will I know what's true for me? Choose, then believe, then act. Only you know the workings of your heart. Choose what your heart draws you to and not what your mind decides. Choose that every day until you come to believe in it. Then act out of that belief. That's how you will come to know your truth. Can I fail at spirituality? No. You are always spiritual. How do I get better at it? By remembering that deciding is not doing and wanting is not choosing. I don't get it. Move in the direction that brings you closer to Creator all the time, in all things. The trail will be revealed, and the helpers will come to you. That's it. It's more than enough for one lifetime. When are things going to get easier? They already are. It doesn't feel like it. I keep waiting for Creator to step in. She already has. She always will. Keep faith burning in your heart. I have. I've been waiting for things to change. Faith isn't about waiting for things to change. Th faith is the constant effort to keep pushing through. What's on the other side? You. What if we're wrong? Wrong about what? 
all this ceremony, prayer, meditation, what if at the end of it, all there is is nothing? And then we still come out better people. How? Can you think of a better way than to, to live than with gratitude? Can you think of a better way to be than to be kind, loving, compassionate, respectful, courageous, truthful, and forgiving, even if we're wrong? Can you think of a better way to breathe through all that? I couldn't. I can't. I continue. To use the act of breathing to shape air into sounds that, sounds that take on the context of language that lifts and transports those who hear it, takes them beyond what they think and know and feel and empowers them to think and feel and know even more. We're all storytellers, really. That's what we do. That is our power as human beings, not to tell people how to think and feel and therefore know, but through our stories, allow them to s discover questions within themselves. Turn off your TV and your devices and talk to each other. Share stories. Be joined. Transported. And transformed. Thus concludes Wagamese's play. Our title for this morning's service is because for school right now, I'm reading a book called Ways of Knowing by Yale D. Bellinger for my in one of my indigenous studies classes. And a big piece of that book talks about how culturally we think of in in this is within academic context primarily but culturally as well we think of western ways of knowing as ways of knowing and we think of indigenous ways of knowing as a world view and so this book pushes against that idea um, and talks about how you wouldn't walk up to somebody on the street in any Canadian city and say, tell me about Western philosophy. And so you can't walk up because there are so many branches of Western philosophy. We know that things are spread out and there are as many Western philosophers. If you talk to a philosophy student, they can give you a million pieces of Western philosophy. There's no one Western philosophy. And so in the same way, there's no one indigenous philosophy. Indigenous peoples have, spread, have been spread out all across this land and there are many cultures that is not a monolith. There are many indigenous philosophies. However, there are specific categorizations of indigenous science, just like there are Western science. And those qualifiers are, according to Little Bear, there are five tenets of native sciences, space and land, constant motion and flux, all things being animate and imbued with spirit. I want you to sit with that for a second. That is a tenant of science relationship, and renewal. That really speaks to me because we have this artificial dialectic, this artificial polarization between spirit and science in the Western world. And that's a piece I've had to reconcile within myself is that polarization. Mm -hmm. So I just, that was the piece I really wanna lift up. I lifted up in a lot of my land acknowledgements, that animacy of the world and that understanding that the land 
and life around us is imbued with spirit. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to leave us there. Thank you. Chubby Cree is a uh, drum group, a drumming singing group, and based here in Edmonton. And they have a, a video that we're going to watch called Rock Your World. Um, it is, you'll see lots of um, landmarks of, of this area of Edmonton, of um, the land and what has happened here. And uh, get up and dance. Get up and dance. It's awesome. Yeah. As we conclude our service, I'd like to invite Lynn back up to extinguish our chalice with the also words from Chief Dan George, the earth waits for me. Nights bring me hindsight. Days bring me doing. Tomorrows bring me wishes. Yesterdays bring me wisdom. The moon vanity, the sky longing, the sun fear, and the earth, it waits for me. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to everyone that contributed. Thank you, Alara, Karen, tech team, those on Zoom that helped with the Zoom service behind the scenes. I leave you with these words of benediction. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world, for things can break and things can mend, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So I invite you to go and love intentionally and love extravagantly and above all, love unconditionally for the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is within you. So go and shine your light around and make it a better place. The earth waits for you. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. Amen. And now we will gather and Stand and sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. would like to have your attention for just a second. We've got another video that's going to be on and it's going to be like it's after the service, but we'd love it if you paid a little bit of attention to it. Yeah. Did you want to speak I about what it is? About it. Okay, well, it's going to be showing and uh, that's it. One of the ministers at Ministry Days, their partner has it as part of one of their his Indigenous Studies classes and it is in Kelowna, it's the Kelowna Residential School. No, Kamloops Residential School, my bad. Um, and it's the students of one of the schools that are back in that school and singing this piece, and it's very, very powerful. <laughs> 